What would you call it when the top rated late night host calls for ending the Senate outright? Everybody then laughs at him and he says, I am 100 percent serious. And he repeatedly says that the Senate is anti-democratic. The Democrats represent 41 million more people than the other side. And they're blocking everything. What do you call that? Me? I guess I call it, yo, this country is fractured and falling apart. And I'm tired of people trying to deny it. I don't like the idea that the U.S. is fracturing. I want this country to succeed. I don't think it necessarily means we're going to suffer and that your life will get worse, but certainly this country is fracturing and breaking apart. This episode happened a few days ago after Kirsten Sinema and Manchin blocked the filibuster reform, and rightly so. Colbert said that it was wrong. The filibuster is anti-democratic. He called Sinema a tool because the, the man is just not smart enough to understand the importance of our Republican institutions. And I don't mean Republican Party. I mean Democratic Republican form of government and a constitutional government. You see, Colbert was showing a clip of Kirsten Cinema saying that the goal of the filibuster is to make sure there is broad support for changes in this country and you don't just steamroll through uh, legislation. And Colbert goes, no, no, the Democrats represent 41 million more people because the guy doesn't know how math works. He seems to think that because like Illinois has 51 percent Democrats, the other 49 would simply agree with every Democratic senator. No, uh, the system isn't just that because Republicans represent less dense states that every single Republican in a blue state agrees with Democrats. uh, uh, Stephen Colbert doesn't quite understand the purpose of what's going on why we have a filibuster, why we have a Senate. And the reality is it's because senators represent states because we are not a democracy. And that's interesting too. The Democrat Party, the Democratic Party. I actually think it is more appropriate to call it the Democratic Party than the Democrat Party like the right likes to do. When you ask someone, when you look it up, why do Republicans call Democrats the Democrat Party? Because they don't want to give them the word democratic which implies that we are all in this together. But my friends, quite literally, it is down those lines, literal. Democratic. The Democrats want rule by simple majority. Republican. The Republicans tend to want Republicanist form of government, meaning we have a bunch of states of varying populations that have equal representation to the federal government. Republicanism. So I actually tend to believe that Democratic Republicanism is a good thing. That's what our country is. The Democrats, like Colbert, he outright says on TV to getting mocked that we should get rid of the Senate. And you know what the thing is? I think this shows how far gone everything is. And I'm tired of pretending it's not. No one is playing by the rules anymore. I guess save some Republicans who are trying to argue with people who don't live in the same reality as them. And Democrats certainly aren't playing by the rules. When you call for changing them, which is what the Democrats just did with their vote reform, when you call for abolishing longstanding institutions like Colbert just did, they're outright saying, we don't like the rules. We don't want to play by the rules. We do not follow them. We're done. And I say this, if we are playing a game of baseball and one team says, I think I should be allowed to have six strikes instead of three. I'd be like, well, that's a different game. If you want to play a different game, we can discuss it. But for the time being, we've agreed to play baseball. Except here, here, this is where we are. This is what we're getting from the Democrats. And in the meantime, on TV across the board, they're saying this is the death of democracy. We've never been a democracy. Sorry, that's stupid. We've been a democratic republic. We have democratic, we, we have, we have a republican form of government with democratic electoral processes. And in some instances, we've elected to have, you know, proposition based uh, or or referendum based uh, votes on certain bills and laws where you do get the population involved. I think that's good. I think a good mix. But the states need representation because we are not an end all be all. We are not just one country that's run by the federal government. States have rights. But the Democratic Party wants popular vote for everything. And that would mean the cities rule over the rural areas, which would destroy this country. And it would result in civil war faster than you can say Tim Pool mentioned civil war again. Let me read this news for you. We'll break down what's going on. And I'll tell you what I mean. 
And I hate to be a Debbie Downer on this stuff, but I don't think this is a bad thing. I mean, I think it's bad in many respects. I think it's good in other respects. I think it's just what it is. And if you don't like that it's happening, well, I'm sorry. It is happening. Colbert did call for abolishing the Senate, and he said he was 100% serious. He wasn't joking. He reiterates his point. He drives it home. Let me show you the, the, the top rated late night host telling the American people and our institutions and then sit back and tell me everything's fine. Before we get started, head over to TimCast.com. Become a member if you would like to support my work, if you think these videos are important, if you think our journalists and the work they do is important. And if you want to get exclusive episodes of the TimCast IRL podcast, go to TimCast.com, sign up. We need your support to keep this uh, machine turning. We, we are not, uh, for the most part, ad supported. We're not. We do have some sponsors. We do get ev- revenue from ads. But we are, for the most part, expanding all thanks to you as members making this possible. So don't forget to like this video, subscribe to this channel, share the video everywhere you can, post the link wherever you can, post it on Facebook, post it on Twitter, Gab, Getter, whatever, because we need that support. We don't have big marketing teams. We just have you guys. Now, let's read the story first from Real Clear Politics. CBS's Colbert to Senator Warren. What if we just get rid of the anti-democratic Senate? Curtis Hoke says, CBS's Colbert proposes the Senate be eliminated if the filibuster can't be axed because it is the most anti-democratic institution next to the judiciary because the, it's the way it is because the Senate is the way it is. I cannot understand what positive purpose it provides. Perhaps if Colbert uh, read a book or went to, I don't know, uh, grade school, he might have a basic understanding of why we have this in our country. Of course, it could just be that Colbert is lying and just wants power for his uniparty. MRC editor Curtis Hawk highlighted an interesting moment where CBS late show host Stephen Colbert wondered during an interview last night with Senator Elizabeth Warren, quote, if we can't get rid of the filibuster, why don't we simply get rid of the Senate? I don't understand what what possible positive purpose the U.S. Senate provides right now, Colbert said, and I'm 100% serious here. It's the most anti-democratic institution, I'd like to point out. It's because we're not a democracy. It would be like if Colbert came out and said outright, the Senate isn't fascist. We should get rid of it so that we can do it. Um, we're not a fascist country either. We're not a, dem- we're not a democracy. We're a constitutional republic with democratic institutions, with democratic electoral representation. That means we vote for people we think represent us best. The states have representatives. Certain districts have representatives so that our areas have a voice when it comes to how things are run. The famous quote, a democracy is two wolves and a lamb deciding on what for, what's for lunch. A republic is a well-armed lamb contesting the vote or sheep or whatever word you want to use. I will tell you exactly why we need the Senate. Without the Senate, without the Electoral College, without republicanism in this country, you would have major cities stealing the resources from rural areas. It would effectively be the Hunger Games. And I'm not joking. I have been to these smaller jurisdictions and witnessed this firsthand. When I went and covered the drought in California, I think this was back in 2015, we went to a small town called East Porterville. All of their water was gone. Their wells only went down about 30 feet, and these were poor migrant folk. Yes, underprivileged minorities. You see, in the area, surface water could not be utilized by the farmers. The farmers producing the food for the cities and a lot of uh, many other parts of this country needed water. So they were drilling wells down thousands of feet. They were draining the water table, which resulted in the smaller wells from the poor families going dry. These people had no say. What The way it was explained to me, the big cities had a vote. Should we take the surface water from the small rural communities? And it was simple. Utilitarianism. They said, look, we've got 10 million people in these cities and people need to drink water. So we should take the water from the poor people. As if the poor people didn't matter. Yeah, see, I'm more inclined to talk about that well-armed lamb contesting that vote. If I live somewhere and I have groundwater and you think just because there's more of you, you're going to come and take it. Sorry, that's not how it works. Might does not make right. I have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so when you have a direct vote, the big city votes and the small town votes, and oh, what's this? 10 million in favor of taking the water from the poor people, 300,000 in favor of not doing it. And what happens? The poor people suffer. But utilitarianism, I am no fan of. 
They believe that they have a right to destroy your life because of the greater good or the public health. You know, in much of our fiction, the utilitarians tend to be the bad guys. That's Colbert. He thinks the needs of he believes the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. It's not completely wrong. We do want to minimize suffering, and I can respect that. But you cannot destroy someone's life because you think you deserve to take what they have. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. And so here's where we are. In this country, if we got rid of the Senate, then New York, Illinois, and Los Angeles would be voting for you. You would live in the mountains of West Virginia, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and a bear would come out and you'd be like, can't have a gun because people in New York don't want me to have one. How does that make sense? So we have republicanism. That is to say, West Virginia says we live a very different life than you. These are our resources. These are what we agree to live by. If you want to make changes to our laws, we get a say as well, regardless of how many people live here. Just because there's X many people in California doesn't give you a right to take our water from us because there's less of us unless you want war, because that's how you get war. But that's Colbert. There's more, though. It doesn't end there. Steve, so, so this is the, the Twitter video, but we have this here from The Guardian. The filibuster, like Kirsten Cinema, is an anti-democratic tool. Because this guy is an authoritarian. He, he doesn't understand the importance of things like the filibuster that keep this country functioning. You know, there are a lot of people who talk about the fear of globalism, and this is exactly why. The idea that you as an American, sitting on your farm with well water, your own uh, chicken coop, and you're self-sustainable, and then one day a bunch of people just voted to come and take your stuff. How do you survive? Yeah. Ultimate utilitarianism is communism. That's where it leads you if you keep going down this path. The U.S. Senate marked King's birthday late show host continued by doing what they do best, nothing. Hopes for a voting rights protection bill were dashed Monday. I love how they say that. I love how he says that. He's a liar. It's not a voting rights bill. It was a voter reform. It would change the voting system. If you want to be honest, that's what it did. I'm critical of much of what they proposed. I think some of it's okay. But if you're being honest, you would say Democrats are trying to reform the voting process. That bill, those bills, two of them failed. If someone comes out and say voting rights protection, they're lying to you. Anyone who comes out and says voter suppression and they mean it seriously is lying to you. I facetiously called it voter suppression to make that point in a previous video. But the reality is it was voter overhaul. So here's what happens. He shows the clip from cinema. What is the legislative filibuster other than a tool that requires new federal policy to be broadly supported by senators representing a broader cross section of Americans? No, no, not representing a broader cross section of Americans. The 50 senators who are currently filibustering the voting rights bill represent 41 million fewer Americans than the senators who support it. Stop acting like the filibuster is anything other than an anti-democratic tool, which is also a pretty good description of Kirsten Cinema. Colbert is either really, really dumb or he's lying to you because he wants to steal power. The reality is, what do we have? 75 million votes for Trump and 83 or four for Biden. Now, a lot of people on the right don't like those numbers, don't believe it. Jesse Waters recently was criticized for saying allegedly on Fox News. Look, if you want to show me evidence that those numbers aren't real, I will look at them. But all of, I looked at the Arizona audit. I had people saying, like, why didn't Tim address the Arizona audit? Because it was inconclusive. There are a lot of questions raised by a lot of these things. But even when I talk to a lot of people who bring it up, they don't give me definitive answers. And now the firm that was supposed to come out with the findings, gone. They closed down. What do you want me to say about that? I'm not the person doing the audit. Okay? Other than, un un unless and until. The way I see it is, the reality is Donald, people just don't like Donald Trump. Democrats have a major advantage in, in, in urban uh, cities. They have uh, uh, major advantages changing the rules and getting established Republicans to help them. But let's just be clear about something. Right now, moderates lean Republican. The Republican base is growing. The 50 Democrats in office do not represent the majority of this country to a certain degree. I don't want to get into the nitty gritty, but I would say it's fairly evenly split. Just because there are 40 million people or 35 in California doesn't mean every single one of them wants this. Cinema in Arizona is a Democrat and she it's a fair it's a fairly split state. And thus she's playing it moderate. Is that in any way surprising? No. 
Colbert is trying to claim that if you're a Republican in Illinois, you must absolutely believe in everything Democrats propose, even though you're a Republican. That's insane. So the reality is, it does represent a broad cross section of this country. Now, if it were true that, you know, Republicans literally only made up 20% of this country, I'd point that out. It is true that the states voted for these Democrats and those states should represent those state values. But that's exactly what Manchin and Cinema are doing. Joe Manchin may be a Democrat, but West Virginia is the second biggest Trump supporting state. It is right leaning. And Manchin knows this. So he is addressing the issue as his constituents want him to. Colbert seems to think that simply because Manchin is a, a Democrat, he must support California. Ridiculous. I don't think the system's perfect. You know, I think it's a fair point that the states are evenly split. But in this capacity, you had an Arizona senator and a West Virginia senator saying, nah, we're not just going to blindly side with these people. But that's where we are. And Colbert has, this is from June, 2.95 million viewers on his nightly show. That is substantially larger than Tim Cast IRL. It's unfortunate, I guess. I mean, we average across the board about like one point, what would it be? 1.3, 1.25 million views per day on everything. And that's for the most part my voice. So this show plus my, my uh, plus Tim Cast IRL, you know, all my videos together, it's about an hour and 40 minutes. I don't know. I, I think his show is about an hour. And so we, we get a third of the total viewership that Colbert does. And, and, and that's and if, we, if we go by unique, it's actually a little bit lower. It's not that much lower. So it's maybe about uh, maybe about a third. Joe Rogan, it's 11 million. So, wow, I can't compete with that. But uh, we're, we're fairly big. No, it's true. We, we, we are. But the reality is they're really, really big. And that's why I always say, like, I mean it when I say share this video. How am I supposed to compete with Jimmy Kimmel and Stephen Colbert with institutional funding? It's not easy. If you guys share this, and especially with younger people, maybe we'll make big changes as the people who watch this stuff age out of the workforce. I think that's the reality. The people who watch Colbert, they're a lot older. And so we may have one third the viewers, you know, in terms of our overall uh, audience in every clip. I would say that when it comes to just Tim Cast IRL late night show, it's substantially less. Over two hours, we get about one sixth of the viewership. You know, if you combine the clips and everything, okay, probably fair to say we get more. But then you got to understand that Colbert and, and, and his ilk also have YouTube videos, which are getting, you know, millions of views as well. It's not easy. I don't think I deserve every viewer in the world or anything like that. I just think that if you think what I'm saying makes more sense and is better than Colbert, like I need your support in sharing this content because that's the only way we push through this. The reason this is happening, Melissa Chen highlights a clip from Tom Elliott, the Democrats crying the death of democracy. It's really annoying. It's brainwashing. Hearing the Democrats, the media uh, establishment, MSNBC saying the death of democracy, the death of democracy. We were never a democracy. We were never a democracy. Melissa Chen says the left's hysteria about the death of democracy can be explained by the fact that it expects to lose power over the next two years. That's right. When the Democrats are losing power, democracy is ending. Great. When Republicans are losing power, they just go, slow down there, Democrats. And Mitch McConnell does nothing. And the Republicans do nothing. They're effectively just speed bumps for the Democrats. Wonderful. Melissa Chen says they know they're in trouble. So blame the system, democracy, instead of asking why are our policies unpopular? Well, over at Newsbusters, Curtis Hauck mentions more than just the abolishing of the uh, 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 Senate. They say CBS commiserates with, uh, with puffs up Elizabeth Warren on voting. And they go into detail about the conversation with Elizabeth Warren, Warren and, and the discussion about ending the Senate. And we can see that this is a prominent cable, uh, I'm sorry, a prominent network channel pushing this stuff. So I looked it up. The Baltimore Sun. Are we witnessing the death of democracy? I am a 73-year-old white male who served in the U.S. Air Force, have voted in every election since my 21st birthday. It is sad that I have lived this long in a free and democratic nation to watch democracy being demolished from within. For the past 13 years, the partisanship in government has become so entrenched that little has been done to benefit the country. In 2015, Donald J. Trump started the big lie by saying the only way he could lose to Hillary Clinton was if the election was rigged. And, and even though he won, he still insisted the popular vote was wrong. Whatever, man. The reason I bring this up is that the country is being ripped apart. 
maybe calling it the de- death of democracy is stupid because we were never a democracy, but this is the de- the death of, I, I, I don't know what it is. <sighs> unity? Did we ever really have unity? I think the reality is you can trace everything back to the American Revolution. Thomas Jefferson was not a, a, a staunch proponent of slavery. As much as the left and the woke may try to claim he was because he did have slaves, I would say he certainly upheld the system. Absolutely. I would say that it was it, it, he was not a fan of it. And uh, it's, it's nuanced. Um, there are a lot of people who are, you know, weak, milk toast centrists when it comes to a lot of issues. I'm not a fan of the Federal Reserve. I still use U.S. dollars. But I don't like what Thomas Jefferson uh, engaged in. I don't like any of it. I don't think it requires any defending. I think people back then engaged in very disgusting practices, slavery, evil, pure evil. But I can recognize the good that emerged from a lot of the stuff. I can certainly look back at, you know, the Bronze Age and be like, what a bunch of crazy people. But there was always some good. The good is what we preserve. The bad is what we do away with. I think it's important to criticize the founding fathers for hypocrisy and talking about freedom and all men being created equal, but then having slaves. But it all goes back to Thomas Jefferson. In the original Declaration of Independence, there was actually a, a, a specific call out of the, of the king for enslaving people and then using the, the, um, using the idea of freedom to levy war against the colonists who were opposed to the crown. They ultimately got rid of it. Why? The founding fathers who wrote the Declaration of Independence knew the only way they'd win, if they could win, because they weren't so sure they would, is if they had slave states, slave proponent states, states that heavily, heavily relied on slavery on board with them. Most people don't realize this, but the original 13 colonies of the United States, yeah, actually there was 14. Quebec, yes, a colony of Britain. They said no, they wouldn't join. And so we say the original 13 colonies, but in reality, Quebec was also a colony of the crown that decided not to side with the, with independence. So we end up going to war. In order to win, the founding fathers decided to capitulate and allow slave states in the South to, you know, have a bit of their way. Within 80 years, we were at war with each other because we did not agree on this stuff. We never did. The North was increasingly saying no slaves. The South was saying yes, slaves. And it led to chaos and conflict. Worldviews that just did not mesh for whatever reason. Civil war never ended. I mean, it did end. We stopped fighting. The North won and there was reconstruction. But this led to a contested election. I believe it was 1876 where competing slates of electors came from different states and the North was concerned. They were like, bringing the South back into the fold was always going to result in this. And so there was a committee and they decided the president by committee. Yeah, the system was fractured and there was fear another war would break out. And it didn't stop there. The Klan emerged. The Democrat Dixiecrat South were racists and unhappy with the way things had gone. And this led up to the civil rights movement. Still, Hard divide between these groups. The country, for the most part, was getting by, but boy, did they not get along in certain respects. It never changed. It never went away. The conflict between political parties may have evolved, flipped, and changed, but there's always been hard tribalism. And you can chase it all back to the dawning of this country. And probably before that, you can say, no, it wasn't the Declaration of Independence. It goes back to the colonists who arrived in the southern states and why they chose to go down there and blah, blah, blah. And then you can say it was the crown. You can say it was the Dutch trade, whatever. But this divide exists and it persists and it's still here to this day. And a strong root of it still has a lot to do with civil rights movement, with Jim Crow, with the Klan, with slavery, with Reconstruction. I mean, it's obvious. It's kind of a dumb thing to say, to be, to be completely honest, because we know that history begets history, that, that there's always consequences to whatever we do. There's a really interesting map. It said something like how, uh, um, you know, global floods and tidal shifts resulted in, uh, you know, uh, a Democratic voter base. And it shows that in the South, there's lush, fertile farm. There's, there's an area of Democrat votes. And it, and it just so happens that this area is predominantly black. And so they predominantly vote uh, Democrat for whatever reason, but there's that correlation. Then they go back and say this was because these areas were predominantly, you know, slave owner areas because they were predominantly fertile. It was predominantly fertile farmland in the South. It was fertile farmland because it used to be a shoreline where sediments would build up and certain minerals would build up and it made it 
for uh, uh, um, it made it good farmland in the in the long run. So thousands of years ago, sediment and other things occur, you know, and build up, making good farmland. And ultimately, now they vote Democrat because of it. Everything's all tied together, and that we understand. But I think you know we we, we can go back to a certain degree and just realize that these conflicts we're facing. Well, they're never really going to stop and they'll never go away. I don't think there's anything that can be done to make things go away. Unless there is one way to do it. And I suppose that's probably what these communist dictators have tried to do. The, you know, what, what is it? Pol Pot, year zero. They try to purge everything and start over a cultural revolution. Yeah. You see, if they get rid of the ideas, you can't be angry about it. You th- I think about these stories of... Um, What's a good one? Uh, uh, Game of Thrones. You've seen Game of Thrones. Jon Snow. He was a Targaryen, it turns out. Oh, spoiler alerts. I don't know. Nobody cares about that show anyway. And so he was supposed to be, you know, the, 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 uh, of a different family, a family that was, you know, exiled from the country. But he's raised by another family he grows to love and accept. And then he finds out his true family lineage. Or how about Loki and Marvel? You know, pop culture references make it easy to make analogies, right? Loki was the son of uh, the king of Jotunheim. A nice, a frost giant, but he was raised by the Asgards. And so he grew up in that family until he found out the truth and became angry and, you know, among other things. The point is, the idea among many of these dictators is if we can erase their memory of the past, of what they've had, of what they've lost, they can't be mad about it because they won't know. If they're all of the same place and we erase their history, then they'll all just agree. Eliminate their culture, eliminate their history, eliminate their belief structures and their worldviews. And then you can control them. It seems to be the way they, they, they go about things. That's why the media gaslights everyone. It's why they want to get rid of the Senate. They want authoritarian and absolute control. It's why they lie about our history. It's why they try to erase our history. It's why they're tearing down statues. They don't want you to remember the past so they can control your future. That's why I look at people like Colbert. I think he's evil. I think it may be the banality of evil. I think it may be intentional. He may know exactly what he's doing and what he's saying. He may completely understand the systems that we've created and why we've created them. And I think it's evil because the end result they want will not make things better. It'll make things worse. Centralized control will just make everyone crazy. And you can't erase the minds of every person everywhere. Eventually, one day, some child finds an old book and reads it and says, I can't believe what they've done. And then people get mad. But I will at least say this. The history you think you know and we think we know is probably all lies. And that's the reality. Maybe not all lies, you know, just a lot of lies. Think about how they lie every day in the media. And think about how they got away with that before the internet. Then you start to realize. So the news that came out in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s was probably lies. Not all of it, obviously. I think there's a lot of stuff that's undeniable. Photo and video evidence still existed. We know what happened in World War II. I think it's fair to say some things were definitive. Some things were just easily map- mappable and proven. I'm not saying that the, you know, like the big grand moments of our history are lies. I'm saying it's the subtle things. You know, how much you want to bet? And I'll tell you this. The U.S. probably engaged in really just screwed up stuff when it came to World War II. I mean, we know about the internment camps in the U.S. I just mean like, I bet a bunch of civilians were killed. I bet when they were sweep, how many, how much you want to bet? When the U.S. stormed the beaches of Normandy and they're making their way through France and they're, you know, taking back. I bet civilians got killed and I bet they just don't talk about it. I bet really awful things happened. I bet there are soldiers who commit crimes because people are not are not perfect. They're not angels. You take a look at how history is written and it will probably try its best to get rid of things that are nasty. There's a lot of black operations that the governments have done that we don't know about. There were a bunch of Nazis that fled to Argentina, apparently. And how much of that do we know about? History is not absolute. A lot of it's fairly obvious and fairly overt. But you look back, and I'm willing to bet that when it came to the American Revolution, man, I love the movie The Patriot with Mel Gibson. They talk about the wilderness campaign. It was particularly brutal and the horrible things that Mel Gibson's character did to the Native Americans and stuff like that, to women and children. And I'm like, that's probably reality. You know, when it comes to war, war is brutal. And we want to create these stories of nobility, of honor, of us being better people always. And in many ways, I think we are in, in the sense of, you know, truth, justice, civil rights. I think we're better for that. We're not perfect. Look at what the U.S. does when it comes to war. There's a lot of things that people will tell you aren't real or they don't want to talk about. But the reality is we do awful stuff. Drone strikes, selling weapons, blowing up women and children. 
And the thing is, I think journalists cover this stuff. We see it. We hear about it. We know what Trump did with commando raids in Yemen, selling weapons. We know what Saudi Arabia is doing. We do know that Trump was trying to end the wars because he's a very uh, America first kind of guy, but he did continue them to a certain degree, to a great degree, to be honest. He wasn't nearly as bad as Biden. He wasn't nearly as bad as Obama and Hillary. They were just awful. And George W. Bush and going back as far as I can remember, the U.S. has been doing really awful things. Barack Obama killed a child, 16 year old American citizen. So we do awful things, too. The reality is the world is far from perfect and everyone wants to be the good guy. I think some things are better than others. I think some countries are better than others. But the reality is we write our history to suit our needs. That's why they want to control the narrative. They want more power. They want you to shut up, sit down and accept what they do with impunity. I don't think so. I don't think so. No, I believe that decentralization is our saving grace. I believe the American Revolution, for all of the possible secrets that were nasty, it was a good thing. And we, are, we should be eternally grateful because look at all these other countries in the Commonwealth and how awful they are. It's a good thing. We want decentralization of authority. It's always good to have some executive position. And it's always good to have a strong decentralized power base. We don't want evil people to get too much power like Colbert wants them to have. We don't want it. We want decentralization. The one, the one good thing I can say about Trump's presidency is that for the first time in my life, the executive branch lost power. Good. Not the best thing in the world. Not always. There will always be ramific ramifications. But at least there's that. Decentralization is important. It helps make sure that power is, you know, the evil doesn't run amok and destroy things. It makes sure we don't, we don't drive off a cliff and lose everything. But we do need some executive authority. That's why I like a republicanist form of government. I like the states, the Senate. I like Congress. I don't like Congress like right now. I like the idea of it. So we need to get rid of all of these incumbents. We need serious reforms. It's the best I can do. I'll leave it there. Next segment's coming up tonight at 8 p.m. over at youtube.com slash timcastirl. Thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you all then.